For over 25 years, George Carol Oates has amazed critics who insist that less is more. Sometimes publishing two books a year, her novels, plays, stories, and poetry continually draw praise from serious readers. Her new novel, Blackwood, is a chilling evocation of a young woman's tragic death. We're pleased to have the author of Blackwater, Joyce Carol Oates, join us, and I uh, am pleased to welcome her back. Uh, how do you go about uh, researching a book like this, and, and how deeply did you get involved in understanding as much as you could about the actual incident at Chappaquiddick to, to try to feed your own creative uh, and literary powers? Well, I didn't research the novel at all. I must say I wanted to write about the victim and there's very little about the victim. All the focus and you on know, the it was on a senator, and that seemed to me really part of the horror mm -hmm. that the young woman would have had a story to tell, but she didn't survive, and so I wanted to tell the story. Subsequent to writing the novel, though, then I didn't didn't do some research, and I read some books on Chappaquiddick. And but you came to what conclusions? Well, they're mainly focusing on on, on events after after yeah. the death and. Much has to do with the legal maneuvers. Mm -hmm. Did you talk to the Kopechny family at all? Or no, no, because the young woman is, is not at all Mary Jo Kopechny. She's much more, my character is much more contemporary. Yeah. She's m a much more independent career woman and uh, really, I think, quite different from Mary Jo Kopechny, as I understand. Let, let me it's move to another subject of great concern to you, which you frequently talk about. I, it was at Newsweek or Time. I just saw a recent story you wrote about, Tom, Tyson, about Tyson. Newsweek, you know. yes. Uh, tell me what you think about Mike Tyson and, and where he finds himself today and, and, and what this says. Well, I have lots of different thoughts about Mike Tyson. First of all, I think like everyone who loves boxing, that we just feel a tremendous loss because there will never be anybody quite like Tyson. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Well, he came up from such obscurity, such an extraordinary boxer. It's not generally well known because of his aggressive qualities that he was a very fine defensive boxer. He was a very interesting boxer for a heavyweight, extraordinarily fast on his feet, and he, he fought in combination of, combinations of punches. He didn't just have one big punch. And toward the end of his career, as, as I'm sure you know, since you saw him train for Buster Douglas, right. um, he lost that. He had lost his edge. And that's because you think uh, the conventional wisdom is because, A, Customato was dead, and, and secondly, Kevin Rooney had been banned from uh, an association with his trainer, yes. and because Don King had brought in his own coterie of uh, trainers. And well, it's hard to say why somebody would lose faith in his own extremely brilliant career and talent. It's as if having been the heavyweight title holder at the youngest age in all of history, he had that which he had sought. And it's as if having it, he no longer valued it. Of course, Mike was very discouraged about life. He had a, a disastrous marriage, and he lost a, a man he loved very much, Jimmy Jacobs, who was his co-manager. Who was your good friend, too, was he not? Yes, Jimmy was my good friend, and he died of leukemia. And I think Mike, I'm just speculating, Mike may not have quite recovered from that, that extraordinary loss. But I, as I say, I have a lot of thoughts about it. And it's but he had, he also, it was like, is this unfair to say that there was with Mike a good side and a bad side, you know, that, I mean, his own experience on the, on the dark side yes. was always in conflict with whatever he, whatever other instincts he said, and it's almost like in the last several years, the dark side. Yes, came forward. Came forward. That's right. Do you buy that? Well, I think all boxers have very complex personalities, and people would always say about Mike Tyson, he's very sweet and very courteous, and, and so he did seem to be, especially when he was being interviewed. Yeah. But if you see him in the <laughs> ring, if you saw him in the ring, you know that maybe this is the the more natural self. I have never seen such fury as I saw with Mike. I know. Well, if you'd seen tapes of old tapes of Jack Dempsey, you would have yeah. seen a distant ancestor because Tyson was very much modeled after Dempsey in, the, in his ring. By Tyson, strategy. Tyson himself, who studied other fighters, or, yes. or was that by D'Amato or Jacobs or whoever? Well, I think they are all very interested, keenly interested in boxing history, as most people who like boxing are interested in history, and they're all strangely contemporaneous. There's a way in which one t one can speak about. Jack Dempsey 
and Henry Armstrong and Joe Lewis, as if in a, in a bizarre way in some other dimension they're all sort of contemporary. Why do you like boxing so much? What is it about that, this sport that so captures your interest? Well, many writers like boxing very much. I think it's a sport that lends itself to interpretations on different levels and that we see two men who don't have uniforms on, who don't, don't belong to teams, and they're very isolated and very much on their own, and they're in this, this elevated ring under bright lights with ropes around like a pen. It's like really an uh, existential man, and, and perhaps we identify with that. Then boxers, I think, generally are very courageous very, very courageous. I'm thinking of Muhammad Ali and Joe Fraser yeah. and their trilogy of fights, which is just the really best extraordinary. ever. Do you think? Well, I wouldn't say absolutely no, the best. I don't like to compare people like that, but yeah. but I mean, it, it certainly was at the top of a great conflict. Brilliant, and also such such power and such such intelligence wedded with extreme physical yeah. courage. But Tyson didn't demonstrate that. He really um, he really gave up. In a sense, he didn't ever have a great opponent. Did he let you down? Do you feel like Mike oh, Tyson? Oh well, I would. Well, talk no, no. That. You I knew, you, but you knew way. Mike Tyson, and you met him at Jimmy Jacobs' apartment, did you not? Yes, but he and, didn't. And so you had t conversations with yeah, him, and he, he wasn't just another boxer. Oh no, no, he was an extraordinary boxer. Yeah, and and, and had, you thought he had all these skills, and he's now in a prison in Indiana. I know it's tragic, and it seems somehow very American that a young, a young athlete of uh, of such power is taken up out of the ghetto and raised very high to a, a distinctly American kind of celebrity. And he has a disastrous marriage. It's in all the tabloid newspapers. He's on the cover of Life magazine and cover of Sports Illustrated. And, and then a, a year later, he's in jail. Yeah, but, mm. and, and so mm. what could have stopped it from happening? What could have made a difference other than Customata being alive? Well, I think what goes into a, a person's disintegration must have a good deal to do with, with the inner integrity, yeah. you know, that there wasn't maybe enough of a, a spiritual core to Tyson. If you contrast him with Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay when he was young, Cassius Clay had extraordinary integrity and kind of resilience and stubbornness. He knew who he was. With Tyson, one would, one start, to, one would start to feel that he didn't know who yeah. he was, and he took on the coloration of the people with whom he associated. Yeah. Interesting phenomenon is happening, moving away from Tyson, of which Tyson's only one part. The Tyson trial, the, the uh, Thomas Hill of, uh, hearings, uh, yeah. the William Kennedy Smith yeah. trial. Yeah. What's going on in terms of men, women, and, and rape, and by, you know, this whole sense? Because uh, w the political phenomenon is obvious to all of us now because of what happened in Pennsylvania and what happened in Chicago, in Illinois. We see two women rising to get the Democratic nomination, yeah. in large part propel forward, not only because they were skilled politicians, but because they made an issue of the Thomas Hill hearings. Yes. What's going on in America, you think, from <laughs> your own eye? Well, we're, we're hoping that the nation will not be divided between pro-choice people and anti-abortion people. It seems to be going that way rather rapidly. But, I mean, it would be like the Vietnam War years again, where you have But this is not polarized. so much about abortion as I'm talking about. I mean, these, this is really much more about how men relate to women. Well, that yes, seems to be right. what it was. I mean, it seemed to be that, that these people who are looking at the, Hill, the Thomas Hill see, affair see, are yeah. saying, you know, they, they are, they're running the commercial, and many of them are using in their political commercials excerpts from the hearing right. saying, you know, right. that women ought to be up in arms about this, and they are, because and these... women are, yes. There was a sense of our, our being very muted and, and marginalized, and now this, this, um, this kind of backlash. When I was writing Blackwater, it was about the, the time of the William Kennedy Smith trial, right. and around the time of Thurgood Marshall's retirement from the Supreme Court, which I saw to be the end of an era of generosity and capaciousness and, you know, liberal era that began in the 1960s and slowly been eroding away in, in the Reagan and Bush mm -hmm. years and now Thurgood Marshall's gone and, and we have Clarence Thomas who seems, you know, seems like a bitter irony. Yeah. Uh, none to take note more than, than uh, Thurgood Marshall of that oh, irony. Oh, yes, yes. If you look at the stream of some, I don't know, you must have written 25 books. You and I have had, probably have talked on the air at least an hour and a half, if you put it all together, some 25-plus books, correct? 
Yes. Is there a common thread you see there in, in all the work that you do? Well, I wouldn't say it would necessarily be in all the work, but I do see a common thread of an identification with, with women and children, particularly who have been victims of violence. I have always been one of these writers who thinks of the, the traditional role of the writers bearing witness for people who are powerless or who can't speak for themselves. So I've always been writing about, about that. And here you bear witness for Kelly. For Kelly, yes. Who drowned. Yes. Uh, because her voice hasn't been heard and she symbolizes for you what? Well, she symbolizes, I suppose, part of my own self, but in, in a more general sense, the, the idealism of young women, maybe, maybe of young people, young men as well, but certainly I do have students and I know young women in their 20s who are very concerned with environmental law, let's say, and they, they don't want to give up on politics. And they are attracted to men who embody a certain kind of power. They're, they're romantic young women. At the same time, they're very professional women. It's um, perhaps a, a new generation where the yeah. two are combined. And then in the novel, I talk a little bit about it in a somewhat playful way or satirical way about, the, about horoscopes because the women's magazines even magazines for career women always have the horoscope columns. Yes. And what does this say about women? Men, men don't care about the horoscope, do they? I don't know. I don't, but well, I don't know. Of course Others you don't. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever met a man who cared yeah. in the slightest. Yes. But they're in all the women's magazines. Yeah. Someone said they're even in Lear's and Mirabella. Yeah. So this means something because, as you know, astrology is a completely discredited non-science. That there's no, not a particle of significance to it. It's, it's been discredited probably for 5,000 years. Yet women who are, who are intelligent women and, and educated still in great numbers seem to believe in the horoscope. Joyce Carol Oates has been my guest. I am always pleased to have her here because her, her range is wide and, and her insights powerful and incisive. Blackwater, it is a novel, but it has some relationship uh, to some of the contemporary themes that we all grapple with. Uh, in our society and things that are no further away than the headlines of yesterday. I thank you. Good to have you. Thank you. We'll be back.